Well, good morning. What a bunch of happy, smiley faces. I love mornings, you know, it's always wonderful to get up in the morning. First of all, you're getting up in the morning, which is always a bonus, right? And then mornings, uh, every morning is a start to a new day. It's a new opportunity to focus on what it is you love and, and get out and, you know, talk to people and interact and move forward with life. So I look at every day as a gift and uh, I'm happy to be able to share this particular gift with you all this morning. I'm going to cover a lot of things here uh, in the next sort of 45 minutes or so. Two things that I want to focus on is I want to focus on how Neolife raw materials, where we get our raw materials and why they are the way they are and to sort of put it in perspective of the marketplace because the marketplace is not uh, always as clear and transparent as it needs to be in my mind. So I want to talk about raw materials and uh, sources of raw materials and where we go and how we do these things. And then I want to talk about how we control all of that. It's one thing to have a supply source of something that you, know, you want to get something in a particular place, but to be able to control it so that over and over and over, every day, every month, every year, every decade, that the quality is never compromised in any way. And quality is not a static thing, by the way. We always find better ways to investigate quality and better sort of points of quality that we want to highlight and sustain. So our quality control criteria and parameters have grown over the years. Um, we are constantly updating and raising the bar, if you will, on the things that we do. So I'd like to just start through this program here with you and, and uh, um, let you go. Before we get going, though, how many of you are, anybody in the room seeing or hearing me for the first time? A few of you. Okay, well, you heard Josh say, you know, I've been around for 50 years. I actually joined the company on May 22nd, 1968. I had spent a little time with NASA back in the late 60s working uh, at Moffett Field in California on the guidance control systems for the Apollo Moon Project. We got to the moon okay, so as a reward, I was drafted into the Army. Um, it's a government thing. Uh, and I spent a little time there and I managed to convince them that I needed to get out as soon as possible. So they let me out to go back to school and while I was in school, I actually started working for Neolife as a graveyard janitor. Um, I worked in from midnight till six in the morning. I was going to school studying chemistry, inorganic chemistry in particular, because I wanted to uh, learn how to make silicon chips. I had been in the tech industry for a long time and I had a feeling that these things called silicon chips might have a future. And as you know, they have. Every one of you has got dozens, if not hundreds of them, that you personally own and utilize all the time. I'm using one right now and right now. So, um, but luckily enough, I had a little turn in my career path there and got involved with uh, Jerry's company at the time and decided that I wanted to move from the inorganic side of chemistry to the organic side of chemistry. Because it is in the organic side of chemistry where life exists comes into being, happens, and is sustained. So um, I went down that path instead, switched from studying inorganic chemistry to organic chemistry, went on, finished school, worked my way into taking over first the, the production facility, then the entire factory, then the entire product side of the business, and eventually ended up um, joining the Scientific Advisory Board in the 1970s, 1976 and went on to become the director of the Scientific Advisory Board, which I still am, by the way. Uh, th some of you may know I retired a few years ago, but just so you know, my idea of retirement is doing what you want to do, not what you have to do. Okay, so I'm retired because I'm doing what I have to do, which is being here with you and sharing all of this wonderful information about our wonderful company. So let's get started. I'm going to talk about the difference in ingredient sourcing. There's a lot of stuff goes on in the world. It's a very competitive place, and there's a lot of people who will tend to give you an idea that you're going to get more than you're really going to get. Okay? That happens a lot in the dietary supplement community. For example, the word natural. Every company will fight to get the word natural on their label. They love that because consumers perceive that natural is good for you. 
But in reality, in the dietary supplement industry, natural means very little. Here's an example of a natural thing that you can get in a dietary supplement. You can go buy this at any number of other big box uh, dietary supplement stores. But this is a, a Russian firm has applied for a novel uh, approval for a wood extract as an antioxidant, anti-inflammatory, and cardiovascular benefits. Well, wood is fiber. So there would be this idea that it would have some fiber benefit. And all things that have ever been alive have to have an antioxidant and an anti-inflammatory component, otherwise they don't survive, right? Every living thing has the ability to deal with oxygen, for example, which is highly corrosive. So, But you can take this sort of product and you can do that. The other side of the equation is we think, well, organic. Organic's a big thing, and organic is a big thing. But really, organic is not a standard. Organic is somebody's idea of what it should be. Here's an article from the Washington Post a while ago that sort of highlights that, right? That says, let me make sure I push the right button. The Washington Post published a story last month describing how federal organic standards have been relaxed as a result of decisions by program officials, okay? Not because the science, there's no science involved here. It's because some program officials, okay? guys uh, who apparently are smart, and an advisory board that had approved grow a growing list of non-organic ingredients. Hmm, that doesn't seem to be, make sense. Also, certifiers often set their own criteria for determining what constitutes organic. So from a company perspective, we struggle with that, but for the majority of the population out there where they see these two terms, natural and organic, together, and they think, oh boy, this is good for me but it can be something that is natural to the planet, but not necessarily natural to human physiology. And it can be something that's organic based upon somebody, some place, who will do it, as it goes on to say, determining products earn federal organic labels, leading some producers to shop around for certifiers. So if you're a producer of, say, corn, and you want to get a certification, you don't go and just get a corn certification, you go find a guy. And you take him out for lunch or dinner or golf or whatever it is and you have a little conversation and talk about how big your business is and what's this gonna mean and how, you know, boy, wouldn't it be great if we could adopt some standards that would allow us to be organic. After all, we're a really good company. And they sit down at a table and they craft this deal. They find the certifier that's gonna do that for them. The problem that we've had as a company is that organic is not a scientific criteria. It's subjective, it's somebody's opinion. Well, we can't base our product philosophies and product history and product development on somebody's opinion that may or may not be able to be influenced by certain things. So some of our ingredients are organic. We do buy organic ingredients. Generally, it's organic that we believe in and we have certified ourselves. When you see these two terms, it becomes difficult. Going back to the natural thing for a moment, there's a lot of natural things within our industry. Here's some of the ingredients that our competitors use as natural sources. The little guy up here is called Dunalia lacelina. This is Blake's Leotrispora. This is a, like a pond scum, a type of, of saltwater algae, and this is a um, asexual fungus. Um, those produce carotenoids, right? And they are natural carotenoids. Some of our competitors out there sell you natural carotenoids that have these things as their sources. They've never been part of the human diet. I don't think anybody has ever sat down to a nice warm bowl of Blake's Leotrispora for breakfast. Not on purpose, anyway. Okay. <laughs> so, it's because who wants to eat asexual fungus, which is what it is. Yet, Industry knows that if you grow this stuff in a certain way and you torment it in a certain way, generally you challenge it with a stress. In, the, in this case, you can irradiate it with certain forms of light. It, these organisms will produce carotenoids as a protector because carotenoids are protector nutrients, just like they work in us to protect us. They work in plants to protect the plants. So when the plant's under stress, it produces a lot of carotenoids. They get it to a certain point and then they harvest all that carotenoid and sell it on the open market as natural carotenoids. You can find it all over the place. You find it in products in our competitors, products in the pharmaceutical side of the dietary supplement industry and the like. And it's just something that we've never been able to uh, 
allow us to fall prey to, where we've always had this sort of a different approach to what constitutes natural. And we believe that it's for us, for people, it's only natural if it's natural to humans, right? There's a lot of things on the planet that are natural, but are not necessarily, and, and probably intentionally, not natural for us, especially when it comes to what we consume to take care of our personal biochemistry. These things are, are uh, just not what we need. Nature made it plenty plain to us what we should consume, and it's plenty much available. It's not always the least expensive or most profitable course from a manufacturing point of view, but it is the most rewarding and the most appropriate source from a health and longevity perspective. So we focused on human natural nutrition. It makes for differences here. Here you see one of our competitors uses these, this thing here called an African potato. It is from Africa, but it's not a potato, as you can see from the picture. But they use this sort of thing that grows out in the wild as a source of sterols, in particular lipids and sterols, much like the ones that, that are so important to how your cells are built. Uh, we tend to think that we ought to build cells from the things that nature intended. So our choices for lipids and sterols are wheat, rice, and soy, and things like that that are naturally part of the human food chain, where their choice is to go get this stuff that costs nothing because the profit margin gets bigger. The probability of it delivering what you need to maintain cell structure and function uh, is highly questionable. Here's another example. I talked about the, the carotenoids. That one at the top is Dunalee ellicillina. The one below is Blake's Lea trispora. They're carotenoid sources. They're natural. We tend to think that in humans, you know, things like carrots, tomatoes, spinach, red bell peppers, peaches, strawberries, apricots, things like that are more appropriate. So that's what we use. Same thing here on omega-3s. You know, there's a lot of omega-3s on the market. There are tons of omega-3s on the market. A, a lot of them will tell you very little about sourcing. They'll say fish oil, right? Uh, and that means essentially they're gonna make it from anything that comes up in the net. It can be a byproduct of the cat food industry. You know, they use a lot of fish in the cat food industry and they press it into that little tin so it reminds you of tuna because the cat doesn't care, right? It reminds so that when you open the can, you go, oh, that looks just like tuna. Kitty's going to like this, right? Kitty doesn't care what it looks like. Kitty cares what it smells like. Okay. So, but they, the byproducts of that means that there's all of this sort of leftover fish oil. Same thing, there used to be a fish oil emulsion fertilizer business in this world, and there's no longer fish oil emulsion, or very little fish oil emulsion fertilizer, because we've gone the chemical route, which isn't better, by the way. Um, so a lot of those sorts of things that were in the background that are the waste products of industry, if you will, end up becoming dietary supplements like omega-3s. The other thing that's happened is there's omega-3s coming on the market now from, from algal sources. Vegetarians are very excited about this. Okay. Um, I have questions about it because I think algae, okay, algae is good. I, I've eaten, I've been to Japan, I've eaten algae with sushi and whatever else that they've got over there and it's fine but they have to figure out that first of all this is not algae that we think of algae this is algae that has been manipulated often genetically modified but certainly grown and manipulated through a nutrient pool and stressors on it that cause this algae to do things that it wouldn't do otherwise it produces a, an oil algae is not typically very oily but it produces an oil and that oil that fat, if you will, can be modified in such a way to produce omega-3s. But it has to go through this elaborate process of taking something that's not natural to make in the end it appear like something that is natural. And it's just, to me, it's inappropriate. It's another one of those smoke and mirrors things. We are not algae eaters. It was never in our plan for us to rely on a whole bunch of funny algae to be a source of omega-3s. We tend to figure that we'll get them from things like salmon and tuna and sardines and herring and mackerel and et cetera, et cetera. All of these places that we uh, get these sorts of uh, omega-3 fatty acids, all of our marine source products. And as, as you know, now there's a lot of GMOs in the world these days, a lot more than you realize. Has anybody paid attention to the back of the little pot potato chip labels you get or the corn chip labels you get or whatever? way down in the bottom, way over here in a place no one ever reads in tiny print that you need glasses to see. It says this product is known to contain 
ingredients from genetically modified sources or something to that effect. Okay, they think that's okay. They think we told you, we told you. They didn't put it on the front, GMO chips. They put it way down in the back. GMO chips may kill you. No, they put it way down on the back in a little tiny print. And it's throughout the food supply, okay? If you go to Frito-Lay, Frito-Lay doesn't guarantee that there's no genetically modified corn in their corn chips because they can't. They, they've lost control of their ability to do that. A few companies might be able to, but the bigger ones have lost control. So the genetically modified ingredients or components of genetically modified ingredients are throughout, throughout the food chain. So we worked very hard. We started working on the idea of preventing genetically modified organisms from entering our raw material supplies way back in the 1980s before people actually knew what genetic modification was. There was a little thing there that came out that was a, uh, a very special tomato. This very special tomato was the first tomato ever that could be harvested by a machine rather than a human. Because if you ever harvest tomatoes, they don't take a lot of abuse, right? If they're ripe, they have to be careful just picking them. Well, this thing was done so you could harvest it with a machine. And we actually got wind of this. Dr. First went back to Washington, D.C. and sat on an advisory panel of the FDA and investigated this. And there were hundreds of people in the room. And he was the only one that said, well, uh, how did that affect the nutritional value of that tomato? And you know, they didn't know they, it, because they didn't care. What they cared about is that they could make this tomato and they could harvest it with a machine and they could turn it into ketchup by adding sugar and things to it like that, very inexpensively. So you could buy that, you know, four gallons of ketchup for a dollar and a quarter. That was the game plan. So things like that, right away we started working on this idea we could see in the food industry, in the technology that was out there, that food was going to be modified. And so we started on that path a long time ago. And because of that, we've been able to avoid these sorts of things from happening by keeping these out. Um, you know, GMOs, it doesn't take you very long to think about why they're bad, okay? I love this picture. It's not real, by the way. Okay, I have yet, I have yet, though I have seen, oop, I've seen this, I guess we're out of power. Oh, where we go? Somewhere, battery's going low. I have seen that the colored cauliflower out there. Have you seen that in the marketplace? Yeah, okay. Um, but I haven't seen the sheep of flower over here on the, okay. And I haven't seen all of the brightly colored fish like that. So this is, but this is just an example of what goes on. The problem with GMOs is it's one of these things that defiles nature's plan. You know, nature has a plan. It's called the separation of species. You can see right here, this is very complicated, but we won't go through. Basically, there are three domains of life. There are arachnia, you bacteria, and, and the eukaryota. And that group there, the eukaryota that you see, puts out is where all the animals, plants, fungi, and microorganisms live. And out of the plants, out of the animals, rather, is where we get the vertebrates, the anthroposmolus, and 17 others. We are part of the vertebrate group there. And it's structured that way when the, when everything was created, it was put together in a very specific way to create separations and distinctions between species. Important. If you think about it, you know, dogs can't mate with cats. That's probably good. Otherwise they'd be cogs and dats as well as dogs and cats. <laughs> right? And there's a marigold can't mate with a dandelion, otherwise you'd have a yard full of marigolds in your lawn. So, and those things are done very specifically. That's called the division of species. It's what keeps the sanctity of that species and that genetic material um, strong and vital. What genetic modification does is it subverts that by breaking down these natural barriers, these natural divisions that are in place by taking genes, the genetic coding of that, from different sort of things and breeding, putting it all into one. This is a picture of the early types of genetically modified soybeans where they took the soybeans, original genes, um, uh, some plant genes, uh, some microbes, and some animal genes and put them all together and created Roundup Ready um, soybeans. Um, they did that for a couple of reasons. One is they wanted to sell a lot of Roundup 
that was the primary purpose because we were making plenty of soybeans. It was about selling more fertilizer. It wasn't about feeding the population better. They will tell you it was about feeding the population better, but if it hadn't been a method that allowed them to sell more fertilizer, they wouldn't have gone down that path. So, you know, as, as interesting as it is, I've heard them tell me all these stories about, oh, we did this for the sanctity of the human food chain. Well, yeah, okay, but if it didn't, mean, if all of us had said, no, we can't sell anything, we can't sell a lot more fertilizer, a lot more Roundup, would you have done it? And the answer is no. They wouldn't because they were in it for the money, which is okay. I, that's okay. No, no problem with that, but just be transparent with what your motivations are. Okay. So the early techniques of genetic modification, excuse me if I bore you a little bit with this, um, are, you know, the gene gun, where they would take these genes, they would take genes from a certain uh, plant or animal or microbe, and they would snip them down, and then they would shoot them into the genetic material of the, the host organism, in this case, the soybean. So they would get the soybeans, and they would be able to shoot. This is done at the very microscopic level, obviously. They would literally blast these soybeans with this genetic material and then grow them all and see which one produced what they were looking for. And along the way, they created a lot of frankenfoods. You've heard about these monsters. And that's because the genetic material that was created by this shotgun approach, literally shooting in the dark, approach generated all of these um, inappropriate and potentially nasty hybrid type organisms. In theory, they were all killed. But eventually they found, oh yeah, okay, batch number 6,943 grew a soybean and gosh, it is resistant to Roundup or whatever it might be. So um, this is the way they take the agrobacteria and they expose them to bacteria through a process here. And as you can see, there's a lot of failures down here, but eventually they get one and they end up with that. So it was very much a trial and error. It was very much an experiment in the real world, which is a little scary because if you get these things out in the environment, you might never get them back, right? Once the genie's out of the bottle, how do you get it back? And in fact, there have been situations that have occurred where the genie got out of the bottle and did a lot of damage. I'm not sure you are aware that there's a type of biotech or genetically modified corn that produces a blossom that actually kills a type of monarch butterfly. And the monarch butterflies used to, you know, they migrate for long distances. They would migrate up through these corn fields and uh, they would go to this corn and it would, it would kill them. A normal source that they would use not only to pollinate the corn, but as a food supply for them became um, toxic to them. So that particular Bt corn was immediately taken off the market, but it was out in the, in the world there for a while, okay? putting the whole biosphere at stress. And what concerns me about a lot of this stuff is who gave these guys the rights to mess with our biosphere? There's a point where you have to say there's a moral um, imperative here, right? That you have to say that, no, we probably shouldn't do that, even though we might make a lot of money, we probably shouldn't do that because it might disrupt the whole mess. So uh, very early on, that's the way it was going. Things have uh, progressed here. Some of the most common things that are biotech today, corn, obviously, tomatoes, papaya, soybeans, cantaloupes, beet sugar, cotton, all sorts of grains and so on are now the, the most dominant GMOs and many, many more out there. This pro slide probably needs to be updated with just about everything. You know, there's, a, there's this biotech apple out. I don't know, you know, this, where you're, this is apple country up here, right? You have a little Washington apples. They just, these folks created this apple and the, they genetically modified this apple for one purpose and one purpose alone. You know what that purpose is? When you slice it, it doesn't turn brown. Whoopie doo, that's a reason to mess with mother nature. You know, as opposed to slicing it and just wiping a, an orange or a lemon or something across it, which won't turn brown either. But, you know, that was their whole modification, whole motivation. So for me personally, I generally, I get an apple, I eat it, I don't worry about it turning brown because I'm going to eat it, okay? And if I am worried about it turning brown, I'll take some steps to put some lemon juice on it or something to keep it from turning brown. 
So the only people that really worry about the apple turning brown are those people that are mass producing apple products like applesauce and apple fillings and apple pies and things like that where in the industrial process of doing that the browning of the apple would be considered a consumer negative. So it wasn't done for the purpose of making the apple more nutritious or you know somehow creating an apple that was giving more value it was simply just to produce an apple that didn't show the browning which was a disturbing thing for consumers. So anyway a lot of that stuff goes on. Today however you know that old technology of genetic modification has changed a lot. Today it's a whole different ball game. Today we, we do what's called gene editing. Instead of taking genes from one thing and another thing and shooting them together and doing the shotgun and seeing what comes out the other end. Nowadays, we, we have run the whole genetic code for just about every living thing. The human genome, we know all of the 3.2 billion genes that make up your body. We know them very intimately. We know them numerically, where it goes, there's an, at 0.677 along this gene sequence is the folic acid activation enzyme that people have trouble doing. And we know all of this stuff very, very well. Now what we know is we can take the genetic material of something and we don't really have to put something new in there. We can actually go in and edit that gene sequence. So if you think of it as a long, 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 long line, 3.2 billion things long, you know, that, right, base pairs long. And I go in and I say, well, here's the point in the apple that causes it to go brown when you cut it with a knife. And if I just make these edits to that gene sequence, then it isn't going to go brown. So I don't have to actually inject anything in there. I just deal with the DNA that's already there. I manipulate the DNA that's already there. So the old way of taking DNA from a other living thing and jamming it in there is not needed anymore. I can manipulate the DNA that's there naturally in a way to get what I want. So if I'm not producing enough of an enzyme, I can simply go in and fix the DNA so it produces more of that enzyme. So when that DNA is read by molecules that come along and read it, it generates a signal to produce more of that particular enzyme or that particular nutrient or whatever. It's called genetic editing. It's really not important that you guys understand it. It's again another one of those things where I'd like you to know that we do. Okay, we spend a lot of time in this. I did in 2014, I did a 12 week course at MIT on nutrition and genetics for the purpose of understanding this because it's developing this technology um, in a very similar pace to the same technology that's driving your smartphones and things like that. The scale and the pace and the uh, rate of increase in technology is the same even over in this segment. You hear about it in the news. Anybody ever hear of this thing called the CRISPR? Yeah. CRISPR, okay, the CRISPR, that's the genetic editing tool. That's an enzyme that genetically runs down that reads this line here and enables me to go in and say in this sequence here's the offending gene sequence so I'm going to just cut that out and put it back together and then that offending gene sequence is there or conversely I'm going to cut it right here and implant this new piece that's called genetic editing. What's going to come from this is this ability to uh, deal with these single nucleotide polymorphisms. These are minor changes that occur in all of our genetic material. All of us have them and because all of us have got these 3.2 billion base pairs, we've got hundreds if not thousands of genetic modifications. It's the thing like the color of eyes and so on and so forth. They're just variations in gene sequencing. So SNPs, they point us at disease risk, to things that are very um, negative for us to things that are sort of interesting that a single change in here can determine whether your eyes are blue or green or whatever. But the knowledge of this is taking us to a new frontier and this is this thing called designer genes. Okay, in the designer gene I can now actually build a gene to do exactly what it is I'm looking for. I can build this 3.2 billion base pair sequence to do exactly what I want it to do. A little bit scary when you think about it. 3.2 billion base pairs, when you think of computer power today, billions of things, I mean, you've got a billion bits of memory in your smartphone, okay? So it's nothing. An Apple Watch has most of that. 
So when we think of the scale of things, to, ma to manipulate only 3.2 billion things, base pairs, is a piece of cake. So by manipulating these, this, these base pairs go together and they produce, um, in this case, an amino acid to build a specific type of tissue. So in this one here, here's a normal base pair. If I take that GAG and I switch it to GUG, I change that one base pair in the middle, an A to a U. Instead of producing glutamic acid, I produce valine. What that means is if I've got something that is dependent on glutamic acid for the production of tissue or some biochemical in my body, an enzyme, for example, I'm fine here, but if I do this, I'm not going to produce glutamic acid, so I can't produce that particular secondary chemical. Conversely, if this is causing a problem and I switch it to this, the problem goes away. What's going to come up is this. This is what's happening right now. I don't know if you guys saw this. This was the cover of, um, I think, Time Magazine last year, talking about designer genes, where now uh, we're right at the beginning of being able to design our children or our next dog. Okay, You can go to a genetic engineer and you can say, you know, I'd like to have a, one of these big Alaskan huskies and I'd like it to have one blue eye and one brown eye, but I would like it to be um, uh, small, like this size. So by doing all this, they'll be able to do that. It's called designer genes. So no GMOs. So now what I want to do is I want to say, now you get an idea of what we go through to make sure that our raw material sources are good and healthy, that are natural to the human body, not just things that are out there that are free of genetic modification and so on and so forth. Now I want to talk to you a little bit about how we control that. It's one thing to be able to know that. It's another thing to be able to apply that and apply it consistently over and over and over, day after day, month after month, year after year, decade after decade and we call it the neo-life difference in ingredient control. First, um, we work to develop products you can trust every day of your life for the rest of your life. So everything that goes into every neo-life product goes through this process. Every supplier, every ingredient has to be qualified. There's no ingredient, even the water that might be used in the manufacture of something has to be qualified, has to meet a standard. We have a standard for water. It's a stricter standard than anything that you could get over the, from a pipe or out of a lake or whatever because of its purity. Um, each one of these suppliers, just because you become qualified once doesn't mean you're qualified the next time. Every time a supplier sends us something, they have to re-qualify. Every single time, every single ingredient has to be re-qualified every time. So it's a very strict and, and staunch protocol for our suppliers to fill. When it comes to the sort of agricultural based raw materials, we make sure that we know what we're getting and where we're getting it from. The, what particular type of organism you're growing, a carrot, tomato, a spinach or whatever, and where it is grown has a tremendous influence over its quality, its nutrient value, for example. You can get two tomatoes sitting in a, if you go to the, to the produce stand, you pick a couple of tomatoes, and if you take them out and set them side by side, you can see differences in the color and differences in the feel and all of those sorts of things. Those very obvious things will influence the nutritional value of that. The deeper the color, the greater the amount of carotenoids in general, lycopene in particular. Therefore, the light colored ones that are almost pink tomatoes are less nutritious for you than the dark red ones that are very deep red, at least from the perspective of its carotenoid content and its same particular lycopene value. So we work to standardize all of these things so we know for every one of our crop foods, we know where they are grown and how they are grown. We even know what seed stock that they are grown from. We specifically state that in order to make sure that there's no genetic modification going on that a seed stock, a very specific genetic variety of the carrot, the natural genetic variety needs to be there. Um, not only do we put those in place with the farmers and growers that we use, but we establish stringent quality controls that demand that they confirm, not only that they tell us, but they confirm with analytical data that this, all of these standards are true, the nutritional profiles, the, all of the different nutrient values of the raw material, as well as its genetic origin. And then when it comes into our um, sort of laboratory environment, we test it again. We have this thing called trust but verify. It means that we trust them to do it right, but we check anyway. It's not that we don't trust them, it's just 
we'd like to check, we'd go that extra mile. So they're continually analyzed throughout the growing process right up into the processing, uh, processing point. As they come in to process, once we've decided that your carrots are okay or your tomatoes are okay, then they come into our processing place. This is the place where we take advantage of those raw materials and, or those resources and turn them into raw materials. When you think of carotenoids, the carrots, tomatoes, spinach, etc., etc., they come in as carrots, tomatoes, and spinach, and then we go ahead and figure out ways to extract those raw materials that we're looking for. In this particular case, we're looking for carotenoids. So we put it through this state-of-the-art technology that goes in and through literally the application of some of the most sophisticated processes and procedures in the entire food industry, we are able to get just a small part of the lipid component of spinach leaves, for example, out of them um, with great efficiency and uh, not only success in terms of achieving getting it out, but keeping it stable and delivering it to people, have it appear in their blood and improve their probability of lifelong vision. Once they go through this process where they're now these plant sources or whatever they may be, the fish or whatever, the crops are converted into raw materials, they go right into a quality control procedure again. Even though we've been in charge of these for a while, we recheck ourselves, okay? So they go into a quarantine. They, the materials come in from the fields, they go into the processors. The processors put them in quarantine, they go through the process, they come into the manufacturing as raw materials, they go into quarantine yet again. We do the complete re-verification of potency and purity and genetic um, viability, the genetic identity. We do this again. From there, they'll go into the manufacturing process where we have some of the most sophisticated manufacturing technologies in the world, actually the most sophisticating ma manufacturing technologies in the world. When you can think of how delicate and susceptible some of these ingredients are, carotenoids are antioxidants and by nature they want to react with oxygen and guess what? About 20% of this stuff is oxygen. So you can't actually handle carotenoids in the real world. You can't just put them out here because they'll oxidize, they'll start to be depleted right away. So whenever we handle carotenoids, we handle them in a nitrogen-rich environment because nitrogen is inert and blocks oxygen from interacting with the carotenoids they're preserved. So that sort of technology that goes into producing these is in place all the time, very much state-of-the-art. So again, with the, the, the harvest, the crops came into the processing facility and were identified and checked and confirmed. They went through processing, went into raw material where they're identified, checked and confirmed. Then they go through the manufacturing process and guess what we do right on the other side of that? We put them into quarantine and check them yet again. Now we're checking these things as individual finished products. So we're looking at carotenoid complex as a product, not as the components, the carrots, tomatoes, spinach, etc., that they're made from. Okay. And in here, we do um, very sophisticated analytical techniques. Again, we reconfirm genetic identity. We confirm that all of the materials are there. We confirm that nothing adverse has happened to this along the way. We can look for markers that tell us that the carotenoids are there, but we can also look for things like oxidative byproducts that shows at some point in the transition here, the carotenoid was exposed to some oxygen. So by looking for these very specific types of oxides, we can determine whether or not there's been any damage that's occurred to the product from the point of harvest all the way up to the point of being in the capsule. If there is, we throw it away. And we go through this process over and over and over again. Ultimately, it ends up with this. It ends up such a sophisticated system that it all integrates into this one sort of linear chain of data. So way back there in the fields where that we talked about that, all the way up to the, to the bot product, the bottle, on the side of every bottle, you're at the bottom, depending upon the package, you'll find a batch code. And that batch code is a window into the database of this product's history. You can take the batch code, it will take you back there and it will tell you where it was made, when it was made, and what crew made it, what manufacturing crew made it, when it was packaged, how it was packaged. It'll even tell you about the ambient conditions in the factory at that time, the relative temperature, the humidity, the conditions outside. All of those sorts of things are tracked in there. So it takes you back to the, to the factory, takes you back to um, the carrots and everything that was in there, 
all the way back down the line so we can see when you look at that bottle of carotenoids or whatever, we can tell you eventually where the carrots were grown, what the conditions of harvest were at that time, what was the analytical data of the carrots while they were still in the field. How did we confirm and how many times did we confirm genetic identity? All of that sort of stuff is really critical to producing products today. The reason is that it comes back to this idea of how well you service and care for your personal biochemistry is going to determine how well it takes care of you, right? If you're not really very, if you don't really care very much about what you eat, what you put in your body, then you've come to the wrong place because we care tremendously. We go to great lengths to make sure that what we give you to enter your body is exactly what was in the plan from day one. It's what's in nature's blueprint for human nutrition. And then we back that up with a lot of scientific proof that these sorts of things work. Where we end up, this is uh, just to give some perspective. You know, the world's a very dynamic place. There are regulators all over the place. A lot of regulations are still subjective. They're not always objective and meaning that they are not always science-based. They may have a scientific component to it, but in the end it's what somebody thinks is important. Somebody thinks is important. That's why the rules in Japan are different than the rules in the U.S. and the rules in Canada are different than the rules in the U.S. and Mexico and they got all these rules all over the world. They've all got their own idea of what quality criteria are. And the interesting thing about our company is we are already so strict about our own quality criteria that we meet and indeed exceed all of the regulatory requirements for purity, potency, and consistency of all of the regulatory authorities of the world. So not only do we meet the very strict criteria of the Japanese, we exceed it no problem. Not only do we meet the strict criteria of the health protection branch in Canada or the European directorate or whatever, we exceed them all because our own demands on ourselves are greater than those that any single government or entity enforces. Now, a lot of companies will see that sort of line there. Well, I get it right up to here. It's okay, right? Government says it's okay, so that's all I have to do. Time has taught us that what the government thinks today is not necessarily what they're going to think tomorrow. So we need to establish a standard. We need to be responsible for our own set of standards. And because of that, um, it's my belief that we produce the finest whole food, human food chain, dietary supplements, as well as a lot of other products in the whole wide world, based in nature and backed by science. Uh, thank you very much. I think I went over a couple of minutes, so forgive me.